Hey everybody, Ron Bulefell, Whistling Wings Photography. Do you like to shoot birds? Birds in flight? Do you have a Canon R5? I like to shoot birds and birds in flight, and I do it with a Canon R5. When I first got my Canon R5, I did a video on the setup of the camera for birds and birds in flight. This video is going to be an update to that setup video. I have made some changes over the months since I've been shooting the camera. And so I thought it would be a good idea to provide all my updated settings. So in this video, we're going to start at the very beginning of the menu system and go all the way through to the end. And I'm going to explain why most of the time I make a setting. So if you're interested in knowing how I've got my camera set up for birds and birds in flight, stay tuned. Okay, so into the menu of the Canon R5 we go. We're on our first menu and we are in the shoot one. First tab, image quality, C-RAW. You can see I have it set to C-RAW. You have a choice of RAW or C-RAW and I have chosen C-RAW. All of the research I've done looking at the research others have done to compare compressed raw, Canon raw, to full raw, there's really no difference in the image quality and what you can do, the malleability of the images or whatever you want to call it, that you can do with a C raw compressed raw versus a full raw image. There seems to be some confusion out there that raw to see raw reduces the resolution of the image. It does not. You still have the 45 megapixel images whether you shoot raw or see raw. All it affects is the file size for each image. Megabytes, not megapixels. Okay, so it goes from 45 or so megabytes per image when you're on raw, shooting raw, to about 27 on average megabytes per image and that gives you a lot of advantages. You don't fill up your cards as fast. You don't fill up the buffer as fast. You can download a lot more images quicker from your cards, etc, etc. So I've been shooting C-RAW from the beginning and I've been loving it. So that's where my setting is there. We can move on down to dual pixel raw. It doesn't really come into play here for birds and birds in flight. We're not shooting dual, uh, dual pixel. Cropping ratio, of course, is set to full. Now this is where you can go and make your image resolution smaller. If you go to the 1.6 times crop, like I just did, you're now going from 45 megapixels down to about 17 megapixels per image. So that is a big change. Cropping in camera, that's a whole nother story. It's a whole nother thing to discuss. Crop in camera versus cropping in post. I prefer to crop in post because it's more flexible as far as the compositions you can make. Once you go to full 1.6 times crop, you can't go backwards. You can go in more, crop more, but you can't crop less. I choose to crop in post-processing. If you absolutely have to get something larger in the frame and in the field because you don't have time to process things, you got to get it off to somebody quicker than that, sure, shoot 1.6 times crop to get things bigger in the frame, whatever. But for me, I generally shoot full aspect ratio. Moving on to the next tab, tab two, shoot to menu, ISO speed settings, not really anything we have to deal with here, exposure compensation, that just changes as you change it, no changes here. I don't use exposure compensation uh, for the most part, I shoot full manual, that's where I have control over the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO, I don't even shoot auto ISO, birds in flight, 
okay? Let's talk about manual settings here. Setting the camera to manual exposure. When birds fly, they fly a lot of times in front of backgrounds that are of different luminosities within a split second. One second, they're, they're in front of a background that is dark. The next, they're against, next second, they're against a blue sky background, and then they're back down in a medium uh, luminosity background, dark background, light background. There's no way that if you're having the camera's meter affect one of your parameters of exposure that you're going to be able to compensate for that on the fly. Sorry. Anyway, manual exposure for the bird in the light that you want the bird in doesn't matter what the background or overall luminosity of the scene is, the bird will be exposed correctly. That's why I shoot manual, no exposure compensation. Okay, ISO setting, speed settings, not worried about that. HDR, turned off. Auto lighting optimizer, turned off. Highlight tone priority, turned off. You're gonna make sacrifices there for some parts of your image shadows, dark areas, and stuff like that. I turn all this stuff off. Anti-flicker shooting, that's disabled. External speed lights, we're not worried about that either. So we're moving on now to tab three. Shoot three menu, white balance. A lot of people set their white balance to auto white balance. I set mine to a Kelvin value of 6100. I like the way that looks in my images. And you're saying, well, it doesn't really affect things with shooting raw. Uh, yeah, it does. Um, that data comes along with the raw package, you know, each image. And so if you're going to shoot a bunch of images and you want to stitch them together and you're in auto white balance and you're panning across the scene, the auto white balance of the camera may change some things between images. Here you shoot a Calvin value. It's much more consistent. Stitching, you don't have to change things so much. Try to get things to match. I know you can match things pretty quickly now in Lightroom <clears throat> and stuff like that. But you know what? I like shooting a Calvin value. It keeps things consistent for me. 6100 is a good in-between value. It's not cold. It's not warm. For Canon color science, it seems to uh, appeal to me. So that's what I have my, my uh, white balance set at. Uh, custom white balance, nothing going on there for me. White balance shift, nothing going on there for me. Color space, Adobe RGB. I just like to keep things consistent across capture, post-processing. I like the color gamut, the widest color gamut that you can get. Here, Adobe RGB. Picture style, set to standard. It really only affects what you're looking at as far as the JPEGs on the back of your camera, preview uh, JPEGs that are embedded into the raw images, things like that. But it does give you a better sense of what your image really looks like instead of going into something like portrait or landscape where you're getting a lot of sharpening and contrast and all that kind of stuff added to your JPEGs. If again, you're not going to process, then that's fine. You know, go ahead and set it to landscape, fine detail, whatever you want, because again, it's going to help you uh, get images off to whoever you need to rather quickly. But for birds in flight and for what I do, I set it to standard or better yet, we can go on down to do something like neutral faithful, something in that realm. So let's go with neutral here. Actually, it should have been set to neutral. I'm not quite sure why it was on standard. Clarity, don't touch it, leave it at zero. Lens aberration, correction. I tend to turn any kind of corrections like that in camera off. I'd rather deal with it in post-processing. Also by having it off in the camera, if you don't really know what your software is doing, your post-processing software is doing, you don't want double application of these types of things in camera and then again in post-processing. So by having them off in the camera, you, you're not going to get that. You're going to have the chance to do it in post-processing and no way to double it up. Now, again, if you need to get pictures off to somebody quickly and you need aberration correction, if you need things like that done in camera, then go ahead and, and uh, make, that, make that change from what I'm doing here. Shoot four menu, long exposure noise reduction, turned off. Birds in flight, birds in general, we're not doing long exposures, turn it off. High ISO speed noise reduction, sometimes we are shooting pretty high ISOs for birds because we want to keep our shutter speeds up for the most part. Most prior Canon cameras, I had this set to off or 
low settings. I've left this one on default. It seems to work fine. It seems to work better than in the past. And I've been happy with what's been going on uh, with this setting. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now. You can go and you can see it's on standard, right? You could go to high. Like I said before, I would go to low or I would go to off. But I've left it on standard here. Dust delete data, not applicable here. I suppose you could do it, but I've not done it. Thing about the R5 that I've noticed is that I have had almost no dust issues with this camera. I've got two of them. I've never cleaned the sensors since I've had them. No dust problems whatsoever with this camera. I love it. Shoot five menu, multiple exposures, not doing too much multiple exposures with birds. You can, you can get creative if you want. I've not been not doing it much, so right now it's off. HDR mode, off. Focus bracketing, off, disabled. Interval timer, up on the top here. Disabled, bulb timer, not doing bulb work here. Real long exposures or anything like that. It's turned off. Shutter mode, I have it set to electronic. Birds in flight. 20 frames per second electronic. I love it. You get every wing position. How many of you been through it where in the past where you had six and then we had eight and then we had 10 frames per second? Depending on the types of birds you're shooting and the, and the beat of their wing, wings and the, the frequency of the beats of their wings, sometimes you'd get into a rhythm where it'd be every frame the, the bird's wings would be in the up position or in the down position. I mean, it was just, it would just infuriate me when that would happen. Now with 20 frames per second, that doesn't happen, and you get every wing position. If the bird looks at you for a split second, you generally get that frame as well. I love 20 frames per second. If you want to go into mechanical shutter, you can uh, get 12 frames per second. As long as you've got enough battery power, as long as you've got the right lenses, things like that. We won't go into all that here, but there are some specific uh, criteria that you have to meet in order to get 12 frames per second. But that's still plenty fast. You still get most of the wing positions. I generally, for birds in flight, shoot electronic. Release shutter without a card in your camera. Set that to off. I'm not quite sure why you'd want to do that unless you're, you know, unless you're tethered and stuff like that and you're outputting and that's fine. Um, and you just don't want to have a card in your camera or you're, you're doing you know, stuff that's, that's getting hot, the camera's getting warm, or so you don't want cards in your camera. That's fine. Not in general for field shooting of birds, birds in flight. Uh, cards are in the camera, and if they're not in the camera, I don't want it to be shooting because, I don't know, I guess I could start shooting without putting a card in my camera, and other people might do that too. So I just have that uh, ability turned to off. That's shoot six. On to shoot seven menu up at the top. Touch shutter disabled. Don't use it for birds in flight. Image review. Okay. I have it set to eight seconds. The viewfinder review, you disable that. Because otherwise, every time you get done shooting a burst, every time you lift up off of the shutter button, it's going to review an image. Even though you're trying to take bursts as you go along following a bird, uh, yeah, that doesn't work. Okay. Because before with digital SLRs, you couldn't review your images through your viewfinder, which is awesome, but you don't want to be doing it while you're taking bursts of a bird flying by, so we disable that. Disabled. Get back to the menu, high speed display, right? Not it's grayed out here because I'm in an electronic shutter, right? Uh, so. Not available because associated function settings, shutter mode, drive mode, okay? It'll come into play if you have things set up a little bit differently, but for electronic shutter, it's not in play. Metering timing, 10 minutes, well, I mean, whatever. I shoot full manual, so metering timing doesn't really come into play for me. Meter's not used for anything, so this setting doesn't really come into play for me. Exposure simulation, enable it, or during taking the picture, or disable it. I have it enabled. When I look through my viewfinder, 
I like to see a simulation of my exposure. It's one of the great advantages of shooting mirrorless over a digital SLR. And so I take advantage of it. Uh, it can be problematic at times when you're, when you're in a really bright scene, of course, and you have your exposure in your camera uh, you know, set lower so you keep your birds, let's say you're shooting white birds in a bright condition. It happens. I was doing it this morning, actually. And so then, you know, your eyes are kind of used to looking at the bright sky and then in the bright situation. And then you put your eye to the viewfinder and it's much darker because you have the exposure simulation on and you have your exposure set darker for the birds. It can be sometimes tough for your eyes to adjust right away. So if you get into situations like that and you're having a problem, you can turn the exposure simulation uh, off or on for just when it's when the exposure is occurring. So there are some settings there to help you out if you get in those situations. Shooting information display. Okay. So screen information settings, you can go in there and there's a whole bunch of things you can turn on and off. And you can scroll through the different ones, what you want on your screen and things like that. This is nothing to do with really shooting or, or being uh, effective at shooting, but it does show you what you can bring up as you toggle through using your info button on your camera, on the back of your camera, uh, and you can actually get in and edit these screens. So, and I've done that. So you can hit the info button and you can turn different things on and off. And I've uncluttered this one screen quite a bit and only have two things showing there. So there are some great customizations you can make here, but generally it doesn't affect how you shoot, so I'm not going to go into details here, how it performs, how the camera performs, the lenses perform on the camera for birds and birds in flight, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but I just wanted to show real quickly. There's a depth to those to those menus that you can get into some levels to, to make some pretty cool changes, and it helps you uh, make things uh, work uh, like you want them to, as far as the information that you see. Viewfinder information toggle settings, it's again kind of the same thing. Uh, I don't have that one available. I have that one and that one. And again, you can go in, hit the info button, and edit this to your, to your liking. Vertical display, viewfinder vertical display turned on, grids turned off. I don't like a bunch of clutter in my viewfinder when I'm shooting, especially when I'm trying to keep up with really fast birds in flight like tree swallows or peregrine falcons or something like that. So I generally turn off the grid displays, unclutter my screen as much as possible when I'm shooting. Histogram display, set it to brightness. You can set it to RGB or brightness, set it to brightness. The display size, I have it on small. You can put it on large. Large takes up a lot of the viewfinder in a really obnoxious uh, location as far as I'm concerned. So we turn that down to small. So if I want the histogram in the viewfinder when I'm looking through, I don't have to uh, have it taking up too much of the screen. Focus distance display and manual uh, focus mode. Sure, uh, if you want to do that, that's fine. I don't shoot in manual focus very often for birds and birds in flight, so it doesn't come into play very often for me. We go on to the shoot eight menu, viewfinder display format, display one, display two, however you like it. I like display one, that's the way I have it set. Display performance, very important. The setting, you not want it on power savings, you want it on smooth. Quick moving subjects are displayed smoothly. Birds are pretty quick, <laughs> so it's a pretty important setting. Let me put it on smooth there. Moving on to the autofocus menu. AF1 menu, autofocus operation for birds, birds in flight, servo autofocus. What are your options? One shot or servo? Servo. Autofocus method, this changes. Change your camera's autofocus method, what you see here will change. There's what's available to you. Tracking, face tracking, spot single autofocus point that you can move around. Some of these are grayed out because I don't use them. So we skipped over that one. It's the same. It's, you know, so it's a center point or one point with a surround area. This one that skips over right there that's grayed is just a few extra assist points. 
Uh, you've got your zone, you've got your vertical zone, and you've got your horizontal zone. But again, that changes as we uh, go through the, the, the shooting when we're out taking pictures and stuff like that. We can change it to whatever we want. You can change it in the menu. Most people aren't going into the menu to change their main autofocus method. They've got buttons or whatever set up on their camera. Mine, I use the control ring on my adapter for my EF lenses or the ones that are built into the RF lenses. It's a really great way to quickly be able to change your autofocus method and that's what I use. So generally I have my autofocus method actually set to zone so we'll just put it back there. Subject to detect, definitely animals. Eye detection's disabled, yes, why? Because I have it in zone. If I go over here and go to face tracking, oh, look at that. Eye detection is now enabled, or you can disable it when you're in face detect so it doesn't actually look for the eye, it just follows and tracks faces of animals if you want. Okay, but we definitely want it on animals because we're doing birds here. Good to put it on people or no priority, but animals. But if again, if you go back and you just pick one of these other ones like zone, like I usually have it set, the eye detection is disabled. We'll get more into this later on how I've got my camera set up and how, how we kind of work with this kind of thing. Continuous autofocus, disabled, don't want that on. Touch and drag autofocus settings, don't deal with that either personally, so that's basically set to off for me. The autofocus two menu, manual focus peaking settings. Again, I don't shoot manual focus for birds. If you do, sure, go ahead um, and set up your, your peaking uh, kind of stuff, peaking on high, color, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So you can do uh, whatever you want there to your liking. But I don't do manual focus, maybe less than 1% of the time. Focus guide, that's again for manual focusing. It's kind of interesting if you want to use it. It's got two little pointers basically that come together as you focus manually to show you when you've achieved focus on whatever your subject, uh, whatever your autofocus point is on. Assist beam firing, that's off for me and my birds in flight work. Ah, autofocus three menu or tab, case two. Continue to track subjects ignoring possible obstacles. I've shot case two on a lot of my recent Canon cameras including digital SLRs. I like case two, but for the Canon R5, I've made some changes. You can see tracking sensitivity is set to all the way to the negative. You can see where the, the default is, it's one up from negative. And if you go to the XL decel tracking, if you see there, you can see that it's set all the way to the positive, two up from the default setting. This right here is a setting that to me has made a huge difference in picking up, getting initial autofocus lock, holding the lock all the way through until I'm done, no matter what backgrounds and stuff come into play. Is it perfect? No. But these settings have made a difference for me, and I'm pretty much locked in to these tracking sensitivity and XL decel tracking um, settings now on, on this camera, and they are the most stable that I've found for what I do most, and that's birds in flight. So this one is one you might want to pay attention to, and you may want to go ahead and give it a try because it's really made a difference for me. All right, autofocus four menu, lens electronic manual focus, off. One shot autofocus release priority. Again, we're not, I don't shoot in one shot much, okay? So that doesn't really come into play here for birds and birds in flight. Switching track subjects initial priority okay this helps too when you're tracking subjects you get your initial bird and you've got that bird locked in on autofocus and you're tracking it and the camera's tracking it you want I want the priority to be for the camera to stay on that initial uh, acu acquisition for the autofocus and not to switch subjects if something comes in where the camera thinks it's better like closer or whatever. I want it to stay on what it originally focused on. So that setting right there I have off of the default of one all the way over to initial priority. 
lens drive when autofocus impossible on. Very important. If you misfocus your first time, uh, whether you're half pressing or you're using a back button for autofocus initiation, it's always great to be able to have it, if it misses, to cycle to autofocus to try again. Limit autofocus methods. Go in there. You can see I don't have all of them chosen. Uh, I've got what we saw before, that one in the middle here with the expanded area, the four assist points. I don't have that one available to myself because if I'm going to use assist points, I'm just going to use them all. Generally, I'm using eye face detect, eye detect with tracking, spot, or I'm using a zone. But I have these other ones available as well. Moving on down, autofocus method selection control, the multifunction button, which is right the little button right behind your shutter button. Just leave that as it is. It's not how I choose my autofocus methods. Like I said, I use the control ring on either the adapter or on the lenses, but doesn't this doesn't really affect anything, so I pretty much leave it the way it is. This is the default setting that the camera comes in. Orientation linked autofocus points. Right, there you go, separate autofocus points, point only. It's my setting for that, so if I switch to vertical. Autofocus menu number five, initial service servo autofocus point for when you're doing face uh, detect with tracking. Second option here, don't like auto. I don't want it to just you know, be looking for an eye all the time. That's this setting here. I want it to go off of autofocus setting that I've got set for my main method. So that's what we've got here. Focus ring rotation, standard, didn't change anything there. RF lens, manual focus settings, didn't change any directional things there. The sensitivity, same. Electronic, full-time, manual focus. Turn that off. Right. The playback menu, most of this stuff has nothing to do with the camera's performance and shooting birds and birds in flight, but we'll go through them real quick. Protect images, erase images, blah, blah, blah. Uh, play two menu, who cares? Um, raw processing, doesn't come into play. Resizing, cropping, blah, blah, blah. Slideshow, okay, well here. Jump, you want to jump 10 images? You want to jump to one image? You can make a bunch of different settings here. I just like to go image by image when I'm jumping using the main wheel, uh, which is behind the shutter button. You can switch those, not doing that, okay? It's, it's you can image jump or magnify, uh, switch those two wheels, but I don't. Again, doesn't have any real bearing on what we're, what we're doing here. Rate button. Memo, audio quality, you know, stuff like that. It's all there for you to play with if you want. Highlight alert. Whoops. Highlight alert. Playback information display. Not worried about that. Highlight alert. Enabled. Love it. I like to see the blinkies, we call them. If I'm reviewing images really quickly to check my exposure, it's not as important as before when you couldn't see your exposure through the viewfinder, I don't think. It would be great if you could see the blinkies or if you could have zebras or something like that when you're shooting stills on the R5. You can't, but it would be nice. But the blinkies are there, just like they've been in the past. Autofocus point display uh, when you review your image. Where was the autofocus point? What part of the bird it, was it on? Enable it here. You'll see that when you review your images. Playback grid off. Movie play count, whatever. You know, this stuff, again, not too much bearing on what we're doing here. I'm not even going to go through the connectivity of the camera. Now, moving on to the setup one menu, record function. Uh, you go in there and you've got a bunch of different things you can talk about here. So, you can set your record and play to a priority. Priority here is number one. You can see down at the bottom there, and that's what I want. You can change which one you want to record to by going into this menu. It's much quicker to use the Q menu actually on the camera to do that. But I've got priority in here set to number one. So whenever there's a card 
in slot number one, which is a compact flash express card, then it'll shoot to that card first. Now, record options for stills, which I've got highlighted right now, auto switch card. There's options there. Record separately, record to multiple, whatever. For me, I'm not, I don't need to create backups. I'm not a wedding photographer. I've had cards fail never in the field. So I like to auto switch cards. So if my card fills up during a really good piece of bird and flight action, card number one or whatever, it switches automatically to card number two. So I don't lose uh, the opportunity that was in front of me by having to put in a new card or switch to card two manually. So that's important for me anyway. File numbering continuous, format the card if you want, uh, auto, you know, all this kind of stuff. Video systems, power savings, you can go in there where we are now. You can go, you know, video system, beep, disable beeps. I hate beeps, no beeps. Uh, turn that off. Power savings, you can go in here, display off. You can change you know, how much time things stay on to save power. I was monkeying around with these things. I've got these things set to fairly long durations because I was trying to get my viewfinder to stay on longer than eight seconds when I pulled my eye away from the viewfinder. But I've never been able to do that with this camera. It's really a frustration. I've not gotten a solution to that. So if any of you have a solution to that where you can take your eye away from the viewfinder and the viewfinder will stay on for three minutes or four minutes or five minutes or until you turn it off uh, versus just eight seconds, instead, you know, you can, I know you can put tape over the sensor that detects your face being to the camera, your eye being to the camera, but that's not a solution as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to be doing that. But anyway, getting, I digress there. Uh, power savings, you can change some things in there to make your batteries last a little bit longer if you want. Eco mode is turned off. Okay, want things to be fast, use the power that's needed to do what we need to do for birds and birds in flight. Setup number three. Screen viewfinder display. I've got it set to auto two, auto switching between the LCD screen on the back and the viewfinder. So that's pretty standard stuff. Brightness of the screen, I have it pretty high right up there. Oop, come on, there we go. Not quite all the way up, but high enough to where if it's sunny out, you can look at the screen, you can see it, look at your images that way not as critical. I hardly ever use my LCD screen in the back anymore, especially to review images when you're in the field. You can look at them through the viewfinder, no sun issues, things like that. Viewfinder brightness. Now, this is something that's pretty cool, and the, the performance of this has, has uh, really improved since this camera came out with the firmware updates. And so as the ambient light changes, I talked a little bit about that already, it changes the viewfinder brightness to help you deal with that. And it really is doing a good job now. And so I do leave it on auto. You can, of course, go in and do it manually and set it just like you would set the manual brightness of the LCD if you want and try to match you know, what, what, you're, what you're looking for. But the auto actually has been working really good for me since the last firmware update. So I'm, I've been using auto for that. Skin t or the color tone of the screen and viewfinder, I don't really care. <laughs> Two, that's the standard, I think, that it came on the default. So I left it there and it's fine. Uh, fine tune the viewfinder color tone. I, you know, again, I've not messed with any of this stuff. It's not really that important. HD, you know, again, HDMI outputs and all this kind of stuff. Touch control. Now, a touch control of the menu, standard, sensitive, or you can disable the touch control. Standard's been fine for me, so just leave it on that. So you can go all the way down through this stuff and you can clean your sensor if you want, whatever. But again, not real important to what we're talking about here. Don't want to reset the camera, of course. Custom shooting modes, C1, C2, C3. You can register, you get your camera all set up, you can register your setups to a custom uh, mode that you can quickly go to. Birds, birds in flight, astrophotography, landscape, you can set all your settings and save them for those different types of uh, photography into your custom menus, your custom modes, and save yourself a lot of time. You've got to set up your camera and then register the settings in here. 
you can't go to C1 set up you know it's it's kind of backwards as far as I'm concerned but it works the cool thing they added with a firmware update recently save and load your camera settings on a card isn't that nice got to send your can camera into Canon to have it fixed or cleaned or anything like that it seems they reset the whole freaking thing and then you got to get it back and you got to reset everything well not anymore you save everything to a card send it off comes back put the card in reload everything and away you go love that should be on every camera and maybe someday it will be maybe it is now i don't know okay so setup number six battery info copyright information Firmware, there you go, firmware version 1.3. That's the latest one, I think, unless I missed one, which I don't think I have. Uh, and it's important, I think, to keep up with uh, firmware, even if it doesn't really add things that you might want or it's not you know, dealt with a bug that you found in your camera system. There's little tweaks and stuff, the stuff that even you think have been working fine. Um, I just like to keep up with firmware updates. All right, so on to custom function menu. Custom function menu number one, exposure increments are on a third, ISO is on a third, speed from metering, uh, auto, ISO auto. So here you go. Retain speed after metering, restore auto after metering. Again, I don't shoot auto ISO, so this kind of stuff is irrelevant for what I do. Bracketing, I don't bracket. Auto cancel is always good to have on though. So when you turn the camera off, come back on, your bracketing still isn't in play that you may have used when you stopped shooting the last time. And then you forgot you were in bracketing and then you're starting to shoot and you're bracketing when you don't want to bracket. Bracket auto cancel, turn that on. Bracketing sequence, right on the money, negative exposure, positive exposure. It's fine, don't bracket very much but I guess that order for me is fine. You can change the order, right, to negative right on to positive. Some people might think that makes more sense. Go ahead and change it if you want, if you bracket a lot. Number of bracketed shots, three. Again, this is all default settings. Safety shift off, not worried about safety shifts. Same exposure for new aperture. Yeah, this is pretty cool stuff. And it's been in the cameras for a long time, and I did a video on this, but I'll cover it here. It's on shutter speed now because I was messing around uh, earlier, but actually I set this to ISO for the most part. Where does this come into play? Why is this important? It's important because if you use a lens like the 100 to 500 RF on the Canon R5, it is a variable aperture lens from 4.5 to 7.1 when you go from 100 millimeters to 500 millimeters. And if you have your camera system set up when you're shooting the 100 to 500, for example, and you're at 100 and you have it at f4.5 and you start zooming, out, you know, zooming in on something going out to 500 millimeters, you're going to get to 7.1. Your ISO, I mean, your aperture is changing. And if you shoot manual exposure like I do, I do that means your exposure is changing. Of course, going back from 500 to 100 millimeters, it's getting, your exposure is going to be getting brighter because you had it set on 4.5. It's going to go back down to 4.5. This setting right here allows you to keep the same exposure as those apertures change by changing the ISO appropriately. This is not the same as auto ISO. This has to do with zoom lenses. Another uh, time that it comes into play is if you put a teleconverter on, let's say. You didn't have a teleconverter on, now you put a teleconverter on, your, your aperture, your minimum aperture, max, you know, minimum number, maximum wide open, changes. So instead of having to worry about your exposure changing because of that, it will automatically adapt to that. In this case, because I have it set to ISO, it will change the ISO. Another way, just change lenses that have a different maximum aperture. You go from one lens that is a maximum aperture of 4.5 to the next one you, that's, let's say, f8. Well, it will again make the change automatically for you, keep your exposure the same based on your settings, and in this case, change ISO. You can have it change ISO, you can have it change ISO TV, or you can have it change time value, of course, which is shutter speed, right? 
This one here, it's going to change ISO first, but if it can't get to what it wants by ISO, because maybe you have a limit on the ISO set, it'll go to, to shutter speed. Okay, so it's just a kind of a uh, waiting there on, uh, and, and an option for it to try to do what you want it to do. I have mine set to ISO. Really cool feature though. I love it. AE lock meter mode after focus eh, la, la, doesn't none of this stuff applies to what I'm doing here. So you can go on down restrict uh, shooting modes. No, really I don't have any of the restrictions on. I'm, I've got them all available to me. So set shutter speed range. This is what we were talking about before. You can make your camera not be able to go any higher or lower than certain uh, speeds, low speed, high speed. Do that if you like. Uh, for me, I don't touch that stuff. Same with aperture range. Dial direction during, you know, shutter speed priority if you're shooting that or if you're shooting aperture priority, plus minus, control ring rotations, all this kind of stuff. Not uh, really something that I ever change. Custom buttons, that's there and there. Now we're down to custom buttons. Custom buttons, yes. Made some changes here. And for me, for birds, birds in flight, really important changes. Shutter button, only metering start. That's what it's set on. No autofocus initiation here. I use back button for autofocus. The record button, shoot movies, whatever you want to call it for video, is still set to that, not changing that. Mode, not changing that. Going to shoot, change your shooting modes, you hit the mode button. Autofocus on. Back buttons, here we go. Autofocus on back button, set to eye detect, autofocus, eye detect with tracking. That is the first one. You go to the asterisk button, the AE lock button, metering start, Autofocus start. That is the next button over to the right from your autofocus on button on the back of the camera. And so now you have two autofocus methods at your thumb tip. I detect with tracking on autofocus on. Whatever your main method is set to, you remember I set mine to zone. So if I hit the asterisk button on the back of my camera, it would initiate zone autofocus and then the autofocus point button, point selection button, I have set to register and recall a shooting function and by doing that, we'll go deeper into this menu right here, go into the info button, you can set it, that button, to another, all of these can be checked, but I uncheck them all until you get down to the very bottom, autofocus method, okay? Set to spot. Tracking sensitivity, again, for this, set exactly the way I have my case two set, negative two, positive two, and then autofocus operation on. You register those settings and away you go and what you have then is these three back buttons that are one right next to the other set so that you have three autofocus methods at your thumb tip. To me, that is just amazing. I love it. 99% of the time, I'm hitting my autofocus on button and using eye detect, animal eye detect with tracking. But for some reason, that's not working for me or it's the wrong scenario for me to use that. I can go to zone. Or if a bird lands and there's a bunch of sticks or grass that's grabbing the zone or the eye detect and it's not working, I can go to spot instantly, put it right on the bird and get the bird. So that to me is just amazing. Having three different autofocus methods in a split second can change in an instant. The other great thing about having spot available to you at an instant is let's say you find yourself way out of focus from your subject that just landed in, in a bush or something like that, you, and you try, you're not gonna get zone or the eye detect to go from something that's focused on way, way in the background to the bird that might be way, way in the foreground when that bird is super out of focus. The way to get that is to go to spot. 
and pump that spot autofocus button in this case it's the autofocus point selection button and it's going to refocus and it's going to focus on the bird so that is a great way to uh, get get kind of away from that problem of finding yourself way out of focus and a bird lands somewhere else it's completely out of focus to get focus quickly on that on that subject okay so we move on down and the depth of field preview button I actually have set to an autofocus setting from um, older uh, my older setup and I haven't changed it because I'm just not using the depth of field button anymore for autofocus because for me I have small hands and it was actually very cumbersome to uh, to, to press that button now I'm going to mention right now and this is has something to do with all these back buttons and some misconceptions and this is fairly rudimentary but I'm going to mention it because I have clients that uh, have these questions so I'm going to entertain them here when you're in servo focus when you hit one of the back buttons and you get focus on your bird you have to hold that button down while you're shooting to maintain focus as the birds flying or moving around getting closer or further away it's not like it locks on you let go and you can shoot and it's going to stay locked on the bird you have to hold those autofocus buttons down when you're in servo focus to keep the, the camera and the lens servoing focusing keeping your bird in focus as you shoot when you have half press set to autofocus half press of your shutter button set to initiate autofocus it's inherent it's innate in the setup to where when you're shooting it's going to be servo focusing if you're in servo focus because you're also as you're fully pressing the button to shoot at half press you've passed it but it's still there so it's automatically happening when you shoot back button that's not the way it works you have to hold that button down get focus hold it down and shoot and hold both buttons the back button that's doing the autofocus and the shutter button down that's doing the the um, shutter uh, actuation together keep them down shoot if you keep it on the bird or if the camera stays locked on the bird it's going to servo and keep the bird in focus for you so anyway somewhat rudimentary but i wanted to mention it here if we move on down the line none of these other settings these back button um, or custom button settings really have uh, much uh, play here but i will go down to the bottom one multi-controller some people may have found that they can't move their autofocus point or the zones around in the frame by using the multi-controller without hitting another button that may activate it first and then you can move it if you want direct autofocus point selection you go into the multi-controller uh, setup and you go from off to direct autofocus point selection and then you can directly move your autofocus point or your zones around on the frame without having to press some other button first whichever button you may have set up to do that I like direct control so we're gonna leave the custom buttons and go into custom dial and you can see that this is how I have mine set up the main wheel right behind the the um, shutter button I have set up to control my shutter now shutter speed you can control shutter speed or you can control aperture all right or you can turn it off your mode wheel they call it the quick dial 2 quick control dial 2 I call it the mode wheel because it's right you know around the mode button I have set to change my ISO and I have my back wheel my thumb wheel I call it a lot of people call it set to change the aperture when you're in manual mode which I'm in all the time this is a new one right the control ring which we talked about already I have that set to select my autofocus method and it works really well for me that kind of setup right there we can clear all our customized settings right now I'm not definitely not going to be doing that all right so if we move on add cropping information this is on the custom function for menu not worried about doing any of that kind of stuff audio compression whatever is on um, again not 
any bearing on what we're doing here, really. Shutter release without a lens. Wow. Again, there's options there. There's reasons to do that, I guess, but not for birds and birds in flight. So that's off. Retract the lens. If it's a, if it's a power retracting type zoom, uh, when you turn it off, you want it to retract, put that on. I've got mine on. Don't have a lens like that, but in case I ever get one, it'll do it. Right, right there. Retract lens on power off. And then add IPTC information. Turn that off. It's not really important. Clear all custom functions. We're not going to do that either. So we go over and we can go over to your My Menus where you can set up menus of your liking. We've got four different ones here. Set, put whatever you want in there. I like putting format card in the first one for me, and that's really all I'm going to talk about here because there's no real reason to go into these things. You can put in your My Menus, your custom menus, whatever you like. I like to have format card as my first menu and my first option in the menu because I do that a lot when I'm out in the field sometimes. Uh, I'm like anybody else, I forget to format my card for my last shoot and I get out there, oh, I gotta format my card. And quickly you can format your card by going to your My Menu 1, or I can anyway, because that's how I've got this set up. There you go. That's a trip through the menus really quickly. My settings, why I have them set that way. Sometimes, um, you know, you get into scenarios where you're gonna make some changes, but for me, I've been on these settings now for a while. That's why I decided to do this update. Don't think I'm going to be making too many more changes unless a firmware update comes out and gives me a fake shutter noise that I can turn on right when I'm in electronic shutter. I want that so bad. Please, Canon, bring that on. <laughs> things like that come along. I may change some things, of course, but for the most part, things that affect how the camera performs, how the lenses perform, uh, we're, I'm pretty much set, I, I think, on how I've got things set up. Okay, let's quickly talk about the lenses and shooting certain lenses on the Canon R5. Specifically, I want to talk about the image stabilization and the IBIS system and how they work together. So if you're shooting a lens that has IS, whether it's an EF lens that you're adapting or an RF lens, all of the control for the IBIS, the in-body image stabilization, is done via the switches on the lens. There's no menu item. You can go through all of these menus. You're not going to find a menu item that has to do with IBIS, okay? Turning it on or turning it off or sensitivity or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, if you want to turn IBIS off, you turn the IS on the lens off, and they both go off because they work in conjunction with each other. Now, if you put an older EF lens on that does not, or a newer one that just doesn't have image stabilization on it, then a menu item will pop up and in the camera that will allow you to turn IBIS on or off. Okay, and that's about it for direct IBIS control at this point. Now, for birds and birds in flight, IS settings, image stabilization settings. For birds in flight, generally we're shooting high shutter speeds, I turn IS and, of course, then IBIS off because no matter what mode you're in, you don't want to be, first of all, in mode 1 IS shooting birds in flight because you're panning and mode 1 is for static subjects and it's going to try to stabilize any movement that it senses. And so it's going to mess you up big time trying to pan with a bird and it's going to give you some weird blurred images because it's trying to counteract all the movements you're doing trying to stay on a bird in flight. Now, for static subjects, birds in a bush or something like that, birds on a stick, whatever you want to call it, mode one, especially on a lens like the Canon 100 to 500, is unbelievably good. And of course, use it, especially if you're shooting very slow shutter speeds. Early in the morning, you're in Costa Rica or something like that in the rainforest, it's very low light. Of course, take advantage of it. But again, if you're shooting relatively high shutter speeds, you may want to turn it off. Mode two is for panning. And so you should be able to use it when you're shooting birds in flight, at least when the birds are being cooperative and, I guess, cooperative, whatever, flying nice and back and forth smoothly, not making any erratic movements. Well, they don't do that very often. They do make erratic movements, and a lot of times those erratic movements are the most dynamic flight shots you're going to get, and those are the ones you want. So if you're in mode two and you start your start smoothly panning one direction, then you go up or down really quickly, 
yeah, the camera's going to want to, and the lens, again, is going to want to compensate for that, and that you may not like the results. So I turn IS off when I'm shooting birds in flight. Mode 3, the same thing. That's for erratic movements. You should be able to turn that on when you're shooting erratic subjects, including birds in flight. And sure, you can. Again, I turn it off just because I don't want anything extra going on out there. If I've got shutter speeds 1 2500th of a second, 1 3200th of a second, 1 4000th of a second, I'm just going to rely on the fast shutter speed and my ability to um, pan with the bird, stay with the bird to deal with um, you know, stopping the bird and, and getting them sharp. So I turn IS off and IBIS off when I'm shooting high shutter speeds. Well, I hope you found at least some information that will be useful for you uh, when setting up your Canon R5 for birds and birds in flight. Pretty similar to the video I did earlier on, after shortly after getting the camera and shooting it for a while. But there were some changes, and I think some pretty important changes. Again, that's why I did this update. So if you found this video informative, please subscribe. And until next time, take care, get out there, cameras, take some awesome images, and I'll see you soon.